take the difference between the set point and the actual level and with this response here, take the limit of this difference as t goes to infinity. If that thing is not zero, there's offset. Okay. Now, the set point is not changing, right? And I told you many times now, if a variable is not changing in deviation world, that means it's zero. Just means it remains at the nominal value, right? Just so we're all on the same page. Right? That's the definition of the deviation variable. It's the actual set point minus a nominal value of the set point. If I'm not changing this value, then this is zero, right? You're always at that nominal value. So in the deviation world, if the variable is not changing, it's zero. That's another reason it's really convenient to use deviation variables. All right. So when I take this limit here, I know this thing is zero. It's zero all the time because it's not changing, OK? The limit of this thing as t goes to infinity, just evaluate the solution. It's just k2 times m. Okay. You can use the definition of k2 here. Uh, yep, right here. Okay. And then you can rewrite this thing that looks like this. Okay. That's not zero again. We don't expect it to be zero because it's only proportional control. Okay. Um, again, this thing we'd like to be zero, and it can be close to zero if this KOL is really large, which means if um, the controller gain is really large. So this looks like this. Okay. Okay. So here's time. Here's the level. Okay. All in deviation variable, the set point is zero. Right. You're not changing it. It's deviation variable, so the set point is is zero. Okay. That's where you want the output to be. At time equals zero, Q2 changes. Okay, I'm assuming Q2 is a unit step change, right? 1 over S for this case. So if you go back to the picture, you should be able to see if the inlet flow changes, it increases. That's what I'm saying. The level is going to go up, right? And you're trying to compensate for it. So that's why you see the level go up, because now you have more flow into the tank than there's flow out of the tank. And so level goes up, and your job is to cut back on the Q1, or that's the controller's job, and you can see if this kc is equal to 1, that's a relatively small value, let's say, of the controller gain, then it does this. It doesn't actually get back there. What's not shown here is if we didn't have any control at all, the level would, pro I'd ha I don't know exact value, but it would kind of be like be way up here. So at least when you add proportional control where the gain of 1, it got to here. If you go to 2, it gets to here. And if you go to 5, it gets to there, right? So you might say, well, you should try 10, and then 20, and then 100. And then it'll start getting way down there, OK? But typically, like I said, that's not going to work, as I'll show you. OK? All right, so there's example two. So far, these are, um, dare I say, they're algebraically simple, right? It's not all that much fun, but there's nothing complex about the manipulations done here. That's to be contrasted with this example, OK? <laughs> oh, boy, it's great to be a professor. All right. Um, so. Here's your, here's your closed loop transfer function for this. Now what we're doing is the same example I did before, okay? except now I'm going to do PI control. I'm not going to write the time domain of what a PI controller is, but I will tell you that if it's a PI controller, so this is PI. We already derived this in the past. The, con the controller transfer function looks like this. Okay. So it's kc and multiplies two terms, just one. That's the proportional part. And then this 1 over tau is is the integral part. Okay? That's p, that's i. Okay? So you can already see this is like the more s's there are in the numerator and denominator, the more unwieldy this uh, situation is going to become. So you already know ahead of time this is going to be less pleasant for you. Okay? So again, just plug everything in. It looks exactly like the previous example, except that when I plug in GC, I don't just get a KC. I get a KC times this stuff. I probably should have put them in order, but OK. So there's the GD there. Everything else here is a gain. Well, the GP. The GP is the KP over the tau s plus 1, and the GC is the KC times that stuff right there. OK. Now, if I look at this. I'm concerned, right? Because I know that whatever algebraic manipulation I do here is not going to lead to something as simple as I would like. 
Okay, so let's see what I did do. So it looks to me like I did two things to get from this point to this point. The first thing I did was multiply across by tau s plus 1. Right, that gets rid of the tau s plus 1 there and gets rid of the tau s plus 1 there, but introduces a tau s plus 1 in the term right there. The other thing I did is multiply across by tau i s. Okay. If I multiply across by tau i s, it puts a tau i s there, a tau i s in this term, and then it changes this term to tau i s plus 1. I mean, it's just, this is, what can I say? <laughs> it's algebra. Okay. So do those two things, you can write it in this form. Do you like this form? No, you don't. Why? Whoa. Sorry. Because, I, you see, at this point I know the situation I'm up against, right? I can already tell you the numerator is going to be first order in S, the denominator is going to be second order in S. There's no way around it, right? So if I want it second order in S, I want to write it like this, right? This is the standard form for second order in this class, right? It's a tau squared s squared 2 squiggly tau s plus 1. I want it in this form. Why? Because that's what the, that'll, the table will have forms that look like that. And I want to use the table. Why do I keep doing that? Sorry. All right, so that means I need to make this term that's s to the 0 down here 1. What is it currently? It's currently KOL, I think, right? Because that's an s squared term, that's an s term, that's an s term. So, the, so I have to divide both sides of the equations by KOL. You agree? If I divide top and bottom my KOL, this, this, I can put it in this form. This thing will become 1, because right now it's KOL. Okay? All right. So I do that. Divide both, soci both sides of the equation by KOL. Now I claim I can write it like this. Okay? Um, to see this, you have to now do the actual manipulations. But, so the, the K3 here, okay? is going to be this thing divided by KOL. It ends up, you can write that like that, because the KP cancels, blah, blah, blah. You get this, OK? Let's just put it this way. Once I get this in this form, and I have a co coefficient s to the 0 of 1, now I can just equate things. Whatever in the numerator, I'm calling K3. Whatever multiplies s squared, I'm calling tau 3 squared. OK? That means to find the actual tau 3, I have to take the square root of that. Once I know tau, whatever multiplies s is 2 squiggly tau. Okay, I know the tau, now I have to find out the squigglies. It ends up being this. This is a lot of algebra. It's not intractable or anything, it's just unpleasant. Okay? So now I've said, aha, I can rewrite this in this form, and there's my definition for all these things. Okay? Okay, good. So now we have this in hand. Now I want to compute what is the response of the level to a change um, in the inlet flow Q1. So I'm going to take Q1 as usual to be a step change of magnitude m. Okay, multiply that times this thing that I have. You can see the S is going to cancel there, like that. Okay. Then the numerator you're not worried about. You look for a term in the, in the Laplace transform table that looks like this. One over that. It's there. Okay. It looks like um, this unwieldy looking thing here. Okay. So the, the K3M, you pull out, and then you look for something that just has this denominator, right? Because the S canceled. That's everything else, all that stuff there. Okay. So it's a, not surprisingly, it's second order. Um, it's going to be an uh, underdamped system. So that means it's going to have an exponential term and a sine term that looks like this. So you can see where this is headed, right? It's headed in the wrong direction. Uh, the more complex I make the process or disturbance transfer function, the more complex I make the controller. If these valves ha or happen to have dynamics, you, you might end up with fifth order denominator or something like that. Okay. So this procedure I'm telling you um, is going to be something, if I give you on a homework or a test, I'd be very unlikely to give you a problem of this complexity. I guess I could on a homework, right? But what would I, I would try not to give you a problem like this on a test because it's just a lot of algebra. It just shows if you can do algebra. Okay. So you might guess, once you get beyond this level of complexity here, you just want to go to Simulink and do it. Simulink will do it in seconds, okay? which I'll show you. OK, so we looked at this entry and uh, found this in the table. That's why we did all this algebra, so we could rearrange it something in the table. And this is what the solution looks like. So if we look at this thing, you can already tell a couple of things, right? It's going to oscillate. It has a sign there. Now, if we look at the exponential term here, you can say, well, squiggly, we're assuming, is positive, and tau 3 is positive. So this exponent's going to be positive. So this, this term is going to go to 0. That means these, ex these 
um, oscillations are going to decay. That's good, right? And if you look at the asymptotic value of this, you can see it's going to be zero, right? Because this thing's going to go to zero, and that's going to make the whole thing equal zero. That's good, because right, we want the output to go back to zero because that's where the right. We're not doing a set point change here; we're doing a disturbance here. That means the set point is always zero. We'd like the output to go to zero, and it will. That's why we put in integral control in the controller in the first place, because it's guaranteed that happens. Okay? So I don't know if they plotted this on the previous page, or sorry, subsequent page, and they do. Okay? So this is the plot. There's two different cases here. One, they fix the tau i and vary the kc, and then they uh, fix kc and vary the tau i. Okay? So this is the level in deviation variable. So the set point is zero, and the initial condition is zero as well. And this is time. And then you see one value of tau i and three values of kc. So at this point, you wouldn't have any idea why these are reasonable values of tau i and kc. Right? Later, I'm going to show you how you find these values. But for now, just bear with me. We've, cho we've chosen this because we're clairvoyant. Tau i, 0.5, and these three values of kc. So you see what happens here. If kc is small, you get this response. So you understand the set point is zero. Ideally, the output would just stay at zero. But maybe it'd be great if it just barely deviated, barely oscillated, and came back really fast. That'd be great. So if you take kc equal 2, it, it has a pretty big deviation compared to the other cases. It's pretty oscillatory. It's pretty slow. It's pretty bad. Okay. kc5, a little bit better. right? Which one's kc5? That's this guy. Okay. A little l less deviation from the set point lower amplitude oscillations, gets back to the set point quicker, it's an improvement. Okay, 12.5, for this case, it looks the best still, right? So when you tune a controller, a common thing is you have to determine which of these is better, right? There's quantitative measures as well, but if you just want to do it visually, your conclusion should be the 12.5 is the best here, right? Smallest deviation, smallest oscillations, gets back to zero quickest, it's the best, okay? This would make you think maybe you should pick a KC equal to something even larger. If, I mean, this is the largest one, and it's the best. Why not 25? Maybe it's even better. Uh, there's limits. <laughs> we'll talk about it. All right. So this, this shows the effect of the tau i. Fix the KC at 5, which is this case. Not the best one, actually. And then vary the KC in this range. OK. So let's see. The tau i uh, 2 is this case. It looks like a lot like that case. It's slow. Okay, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not very oscillatory, but it's sl too slow. The deviation is too large. Okay? So that's not a good value. You remember the weighting of the integral term is 1 over tau i. So the smaller tau i is, the bigger the integral weighting is, because it's 1 over tau i. Tau i 0.5 is this guy. You can see this is the common trade-off you get. So this looks better, right? It's, fa it's much faster. It's not the deviations from the set point aren't as great, but it's starting to oscillate. You see, like, this didn't oscillate. Now it's starting to oscillate. If you take it to be 0.2, it's fastest still. Deviation smalls, but now it's the most oscillatory. So then it's kind of a trade-off, right? Do you, how fast do you want it to be versus how oscillatory do you want it to be? So if someone asked me what was the best of these three cases, I'd probably be conservative. I'd take this middle one. It's pretty fast, but it's not quite as oscillatory as the other one. Oscillations are bad because they're the precursor to instability, right? If, if these oscillations don't damp but grow, the system's not going to be stable. So once you start seeing oscillations like this, you start getting nervous. All right? OK, so again, uh, probably starting next week, I'll start showing you how you can actually find these values of the, of the tuning parameters. And when you guys are in lab, you, get, well, you have the heat exchanger experiment, you have the distillation experiment, um, I guess you have a, um, I guess you're using the pH system maybe for liquid level control at this point, I don't know. But these experiments all have control, and they all have, um, they all have PI controllers or PID, and that you have to tune them all, right? So I think this semester you guys tend to do experiments that don't have a lot of control because because you know other, otherwise you're doing stuff we haven't covered in the class. But when you take the class in the spring, if you're taking 402, some of you will take the bio lab, I guess. But if you take 402, you'll, pro you'll at least have one experiment where you go through this tuning of the controller. Okay? So the idea is I'll give you all the machinery to do that. 
and then you'll forget and come ask me because I usually want to have happen. All right, that's fine. Okay, so um, here is a slightly, this is a variation on a theme. So it's the same system that we use to motivate all these examples, but now it's what I said at the beginning, right? And I wish I would have not said, but so in this case, flow goes in, flow go, two flows in, one flow out, and you can tell by the picture here we can control the flow out, right? This is a more common way to do level control. Usually when you're controlling level in a drum or a tank, you control the, you manipulate the level out of the drum, not in, but okay. So whatever the flows are, we can manipulate arbitrarily the flow out because we have a pump. If you don't have a pump, you can't arbitrarily change the flow, right? Because it'll be gravity driven. But if you have a pump, you can do whatever you want. That's why we have a pump here. And so what we're going to do here is either you pump and have a valve or you could just alter the pump directly. But um, we're going to measure the level, send that signal to a controller, compare it to a set point, send a signal to this valve. Okay? So obviously if you want to cut the flow back, we'll close this valve, otherwise we'll open it up. All right, so ex same exact problem, except the difference is instead of manipulating that flow, inlet flow, we'll manipulate this outflow flow. Uh, model's exactly the same, because the, mo the model of the process doesn't, isn't determined by how you do control, right? This is the mass balance. Doesn't matter what you control, okay? So exact same equation. All right, so what are we gonna do here? Well, same thing. Cancel the rows, take the A, divide through. Now specify deviation variables. So if you look at the problem statement, Q1 changes. It's the disturbance. Q3 changes because we're manipulated to do control. Nothing's said about Q2, okay? That implies, or I would tell you actually in a real problem statement on a test or homework, Q2 is constant, doesn't change, okay? If Q2 is constant, its deviation variable is zero. Q2 prime is zero, okay? So when I took this equation and found the deviation model, again, divided by rho and A, this term is gonna drop out because it doesn't change, okay? So you end up with this thing here, all right? So now, <coughs> in a small step, if you take the Laplace transform of this equation, I claim you can write it like this. This, is, this, should, be, this should be visible to you, okay? Because what am I going to get here? I'm just going to get an S times Laplace transform of H. I'm going to divide through by the S, and I'm going to get this. And again, we capitalize everything for some unknown reason. That's what the book does, okay? So again, if we look at this thing, this makes physical sense to us for several reasons. First of all, why is the transfer function 1 over a plus s? Because this is an integrating system, OK? This is not self-regulating, right? If you have two flows coming in, you have to choose the flow coming out that's the sum of those two flows, or the, or the lev uh, level won't, ah, the flows won't be balanced, the level will be changing. So this is not self-regulating. It's an integrating system. The level is going to be the difference between the integral of the difference between those flows coming in and the flow coming out. So it's an integrating transfer function, just like the example we did way back. Okay, no surprise there. Um, you can see that you have the same transfer function that determines how the disturbance affects the level and how the manipulated input affects the level, except they have a different sign, right? So it's not, it's not surprising that the level is affected the same way by Q1 and Q3, it's just this increases it and this decreases it. So that's why it's a minus. So that's, that's like no surprise either, okay? So in this case, you have two transfer functions. There's the one for the manipulated input, which is Q3. It's minus A over S, and that's the one for the disturbance, okay? So actually simpler than the problem we did before. Huh, at least I thought so. Okay, so we're going to go through this fast. This is just a massive amount of algebra, okay? So what do I want to do? I want to do PI control, and I want to do it for this example. So where the process and disturbance transfer functions, GP and GD, are the ones I just showed you on the previous page. So guess what you do? Take the general transfer function for disturbance changes um, and plug into it. So for our case, this is the um, output that we want to control, the level. This is the disturbance variable, the Q1, the inlet flow. And then there's plug all the stuff in. GD is that. Right, 1 over AS. GP is minus 1 over AS. This KC times that is the controller, and then the valve is the KC. The measurement device is KM. Okay, just plug in. All right. Now, in a big leap of faith here, I'm claiming the following. It's very similar to the previous example, but my claim is if I can rearrange this equation to look like this. 
How am I going to do this? Well, not surprising, I'm going to multiply across by 8, A times S. So I'm going to multiply across by tau I S. I'm going to look at the coefficient down here that multiplies S to the 0. If it's not 1, I'll divide by whatever it is to make it 1. And then I'll get this. It's just algebra, same, we, same as we did before. Okay. And if you do all that algebra, you'll find you can write it in this form. I've called this K4, tau 4, and squiggly 4 because this is the fourth example. There's nothing magical about the numbering, just so we don't have the same numbers as the fourth. So that's the K4, that's the squiggly 4, and there's the tau 4. Okay. All right, now I want to consider what happens if I do a set point change. Sorry, a disturbance change. M over S. So multiply this thing here times M over S. The S will cancel there. Look for that thing in the, it's the same as before. The only difference is we have different K squiggly and tau. Solution looks the same though otherwise, right? So solution looks like this. It's right in the table. Just look up this entry. I, I'm trying to cancel as much stuff as I can. Don't forget the S there. Just this term, one over that, okay? It's that, and then multiply that times K, um, K4 times M. Get this. Okay, so Conceptually, this looks the same. If you were to analyze this, so this stuff I'm, I'm stating, I'm not actually showing, but if you were to take this <coughs> equation into MATLAB or wherever you want and see how the parameters of the controller, tau i and tau c, affect the response, just like we did on the, in the previous example, you would find that increasing tau i makes the response less, it's an oscillatory response, right? It's a stable oscillations damp out because this, this power is um, positive. You know, sorry. It's minus something times t. So these oscillations will decay. And if you make tau i, as you make tau i larger and larger, you'll find there's, it's less and less oscillatory. Right? And that's not surprising because the weighting of the integral term is 1 over tau i. If you make tau i large, you make the integral term small, and that tends to make it more stable. Slower, but more stable. Okay. So I put here expected. If someone said this behavior occurred, I would say, duh, yeah. That's, that's what it always happens. What's interesting about this case is that if you make KC larger, that makes it less oscillatory. That's not what usually happens. Usually if a system's os uh, oscillatory, so let me just write this out. Um, oh, goody. I'm just, this is a continuation of this equation. I'm writing a PI controller. Um, okay, right, so PI controller would be written like this. You have the bias term, you have the proportional term, you have the integral term. And because I already wrote it this way, I just took the KC and multiplied both. P and I terms, okay. So you see, if you make KI large, you increase the value of KI, you make this coefficient multiplying the integral term small, okay? So this has a smaller contribution. That makes the system as less stable, not surprising there. But if you increase KC, which appears here and here, that'll put more weighting on the air, it'll put more weighting on the integral of the air. You expect that to make the system faster, but less stable. That's usually the trade-off. The better performance you want, the more likely it is to become oscillatory and then unstable. We'll talk about that. So the fact that increasing KC makes it less oscillatory is not what you expect. So the moral of the story of this slide is that integrating systems are weird. Okay, they, they often defy what you normally think of. And again, if you go into a plant, um, I can guarantee you any plant, well, at least in basic and commodity chemicals, will have these kind of controllers all over the plant. Because every unit op big unit operation, like a column or reactor, will have drums that hold inventory bef before them. So they're very common things you have to control. OK, so finally, how are we doing on time here? Not pretty good. We'll get early lunch. That's awesome. Or at least I hope so. All right. So now I'm doing the same example that I did um, in this case. Um, I'm going to do it all in Simulink. For some reason, though, I check this. The for some reason, I have a slightly different value of kv in my example compared to the kv here. These are two different numbers. I don't know why. I didn't check why. Okay, I don't think it, it's not going to fundamentally change anything. I'm just pointing it out. It wouldn't be exactly the same. Everything else is exactly the same. Same value of the valve resistance, 
same value of the time constant, which is that times the cross-sectional area, gain of the measurement device, gain of the IP to converter, gain of the valve, okay? These are the two controller gains, okay? So if we looked at wh why the controller has these units, first of all, not surprising, integral time has units of uh, time, which is minutes. And so why does it have units of this? So the, um, we're, for this example, what we're, um, the output is H and, no, sorry, the input, the input, <laughs> fumbling around up here, I'm kind of hungry actually. Um, so let's see, what is the controller? The controller is the transfer function, the output is the U, and the input is actually, I guess the output we call P, that's the signal being sent to the valve. The input is the air signal, okay? So that, in this case, I think the air will have units of meters. Well, actually, it'll be percent. What are they? Why guess? <coughs> Sorry, I have, to, I have to do this. Don't hate me. Well, don't hate me any more than you already hate me. All right. Okay, here I go. Well, that's really weird. I'm pretty sure the units I've written on that slide are incorrect, because this is supposed to be this example, right? You can look at the units. I mean, it's not, you don't be a rocket scientist to figure the units are percent to percent. Okay. Um, so I'll correct this slide. Don't, don't believe these units. It's a big lie. I sit on a throne of lies. I don't know if you've ever saw Elf but it's a pretty good movie. All right. Um, all right, so these units are not correct. Just ignore those units. Sorry about that. OK, so what I want to do is simulate this thing in, in, in Simulink. Why? Because we've concluded that we don't like this process here of taking the inverse Laplace transform. This thing is getting complex, so we want to learn how to do this in, in MATLAB or Simulink. OK. All right. So. What I'm trying to tell you here is there's different kind of controllers in MATLAB that you can use um, when you open a PI controller. The examples I developed are in a little bit older version. They tend to use what's called the parallel PI version. So in other words, if you have a PI controller, that this is how we like to write it in the class, but MATLAB wants you to write it like this if it's the parallel form. Multiply these two terms out, and then it calls the KC K1 and then it calls KC divided by tau i K2, and it wants you to enter the numbers K1 and K2. So obviously, if you know KC and tau i, you can figure out what K1 and K2 are, right? K1 is KC, K2 is KC divided by tau i. So in this case, with these two numbers here, that makes K1 5, K2 10. And that's the numbers you have to enter, okay, for the way I put it together. All right, so if we look at this um, thing, I'll go through this quickly. So again, all these examples, if I'm not mistaken, are posted and you can look at them anytime you want and run them. So that's this guy, liquid level control. All right. All right, so I put this together. It simulates the example I just explained, which is exactly the example we did at the beginning throughout the whole class, except I have a different value of kV, the gain of the valve for some reason. So you've already done this kind of yourself, but what have I done? So let's start over here. It doesn't quite fit on the slide, but I'll get it to fit in a second. So in this case, I'm only interested in simulating disturbances, okay? So I've, I've put two um, constants here, right? So because I'm dealing with deviation variables, I put zero in for the set point, meaning I'm not changing the set point, and I'm putting one in for the inlet flow, meaning I'm doing a unit step change, right? You can either put a step change that changes at time zero. The, the value of putting a step change is you could change when it occurs. If I put one there, I'm assuming it occurs at time zero. But OK, so unit step change in the inlet flow, all right? So I'm going to write the set point to the workspace so I can plot it. And you remember what I have to do. I'll show you the rest. But I'm going to take the output over here. I have a gain. This is my measurement device. I put the set point through the same thing to compare them to the same units. Obviously, it doesn't matter if it's zero. Generate the error signal. That's going to go through this block, which I'll show you in a minute. 
that goes through this I to P converter with that gain, that goes through the valve with this gain, right? And the output of this valve is the flow rate, which we called Q2, and that's the flow rate Q1. They add up because they have the same effect on the output. They go through this transfer function, which is what you get when you plug in all the values for the example we had, and then, you, then I'm going to write that to the workspace over there. Okay. All right, so let's see if there's anything remotely interesting here. So if we look at our PID controller, you see it tells you how it wants you to enter it. It says, please enter your controller like this. That's what I just put on the previous slide, right? So I told you the P I call 5 and the I I call 10. I have no derivative, so I'm calling that 0. So you just have to make sure that you're taking the, pr the equation that you have for the controller and writing it the way it wants. It has different forms of this. I'm an, I have an older form or older version of MATLAB, but it has different forms. You have to just make sure you're entering it correctly. Okay, so I enter that. And then I have some time specified here. I don't know how I came up with five. I guess that's a good time. Run, run this thing. It gives you a little ding. Of course, it gives you your obligatory warning messages that we ignore. You can type who, because I can't see the workspace thing that usually is way to the right, but type in who. You can see it's created some variables. That's good. So I can, you know, plot like um, T out. It all, you don't have to. It creates T out for you. You never have to do that. So T out and then T out. Whoops. My typing leaves a lot to be desired. Let me make that one red. Hopefully, this will all work out for us. OK. And so then you generate a plot like that. OK. So all I've, I've, this is not a great achievement. I've, I've stored a vector, you know, so when I stored the set point in the workspace, I had to store a vector of zeros because so I could plot it, right? And then this is the output of the controller. It's very similar to the responses you saw on the previous slide that were generated from the book. Output starts at zero because I'm dealing with the deviation variable. The inlet flow ch increases. Right, so that causes the level to go up. The controller compensates, even though I don't show it. I probably should. I guess I don't. I probably should show you what the input looks like, but I'm not going to. Um, so it's going to cut back on the flow Q2 to do this, right? And so this is, it gives you this response. So if you're in the laboratory or doing a homework or whatever, um, there's no way to know this is good unless you try some other parameters, right? Like you might say that, that seems pretty good. And I'll say, relative to what? And you're like, relative to nothing. <laughs> so, so you might say, well, you know, that deviation is kind of large. It's not very oscillatory. So, you know, maybe I should try to, and then I'm going to let you go. Don't worry. Um, so first thing, well, I'm proud of myself. Whoops. So I'll hold this plot, OK? Then I'll come back to this guy here, <coughs> and I will try a bigger value of KC. So you have to understand, when I increase KC, I have to increase both those because they both have KC in the numerator. So let's say I want to double it. So I think I have to make it 10 and 20. If you go back and look at the equation, this corresponds to increasing the KC by a factor of 2. Save that thing. Um, run that thing. Um, plot that thing. I don't need the set point. I already have it plotted. And I'll call this thing um, magenta because I really like that color. And 